Welcome, everyone. Um, this is Sabrina Paganoni. I'm so excited to be here. We're going to leave people a few seconds to uh, join. I know people are joining from the waiting room. So thank you, everyone, for joining. As I see the names come up, I see I recognize some familiar faces and then new people. So I know many of you have followed um, us for many weeks. So thank you for coming back and, and we'll give you a, a, an update as always. But also for the new people, just a quick reminder, uh, feel free to start typing your questions in the Q&A chat uh, and we'll take them live. So, and with that, let's let's start. And today I'm really excited to be here with Dr. Sukovic, uh, with uh, Anne and with Dr. Lada, uh, our guest speaker for today, uh, who is the CIPI of this trial at the Baron Neurological Institute. Dr. Lada. Thanks, Sabrina. Thanks, Merritt. Thanks, uh, the Niels team for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, so um, maybe next slide. Okay, so, um, you know, Briefly, I want to just tell you a little bit about my site. Um, so we've been um, part of Niels for a, a good amount of time. I originally came to Barrow probably, uh, I think it was in 2000. And in 2007 is when I took over the MDA and the ALS clinic. And, you know, Barrow was a pretty small clinic at that time. We, I think, only had about 30 patients and we had an occupational therapist and a social worker and that's about it. And um, I really fell in love with, with taking care of, of people with ALS. Um, I think it's, it's no secret to anyone on this call that, um, that people with ALS are notoriously the nicest people you have to deal with in your professional uh, world. And, and so you really develop quite a bond. Um, and and I, I really developed great feelings for all my patients, which really made it rewarding to try to help them. Um, and that's really what made me fall in love with, with being an ALS neurologist. Um, and I quickly realized that, you know, the, we wanted to build something bigger um, to really help patients more than we already were. And so we started kind of building a team over the years and we were able to really um, expand our clinic. We were able to bring in some great people um, to kind of help with, with expanding further. And, and that's what you kind of see here. So this is really um, has been my labor of love over the last um, 20 years or so. So we, unlike maybe some other sites, we have a couple of different arms to our clinic. Um, obviously we have the, the regular ALS clinic team, which is a, a full multidisciplinary clinic. Um, and we're pretty busy. We do a full day of ALS clinic a week and we're probably taking care of um, about 250 uh, ALS patients at any given time. Um, we see about 100 patients a month or, or so. Um, then we have um, our clinical research unit, which um, I'll talk a little bit more about in terms of the platform trial in a minute, but um, we've got about um, four or five coordinators now. Um, and um, and uh, myself is, is the PI for most of the studies. And then Dr. Jacobson is, is the uh, sub-I for most of the studies. We have a good cohort of ALS scientists, and that's led by Dr. Bowser, who you see here in the in the first picture. Um, he came to Barrow um, several, probably in 2010 or so, um, and has really built a great science program. He's brought in Dr. Sattler and and hired several postdocs who have been um, really productive here. Uh, and then um, Dr. Scheffner, who you see in the next picture. Um, down is really the, the, the organizer and founder of our Barrow CRO, which is a clinical research organization. And really um, his role is separate from actually running the trials here and more um, looking at outcomes and training for trials all over the world. And um, he participates obviously in the platform trial where he helps sites um, get trained so that they can do these measures like the pulmonary function testing and the ALS FRS so that they can all do them exactly the same way so that the data is meaningful across different sites. Um, Gail Kittle is the next person there. She's uh, next to Dr. Scheffner and she um, is actually the person often with the boots on the ground um, at the Barrow CRO. And then last but not least, you'll see the, the bottom line there is really our, our Healy platform trial team at Barrow. And, and these are the people who um, help us on a day-to-day -day basis um, take care of our platform trial patients and really run this trial here. We've had um, 
a really fun time doing this trial. I think it's it's an exciting trial, especially for a lot of the reasons you guys already know about, which is that it's never been done before, this sort of trial for ALS. Um, and we're excited about the amount of efficiency that it brings to ALS clinical research um, and allowing us to really test more drugs more quickly and get answers for ALS. Um, I think, you know, our experience with the platform trial has been first that it, it's great to work with the team at, at MGH, um, both Merritt and Sabrina and their teams have been fantastic to work with. And, and a lot of that comes from their experience, but also the fact that they're on kind of the same level of, uh, as us, as people who take care of ALS patients. And when you do trials with, with only um, pharmaceutical companies, um, they have a different perspective that that they don't necessarily understand our perspective. And so it's really nice to work with people who understand where you're coming from um, as, a, as a site um, investigator or a site for a trial. Um, this has been a really complicated study. I think, you know, the, the, some of the challenges we've um, uh, encountered have been, number one, COVID has been difficult. Um, but but um, having the staff, I think, to, to run this trial is, is definitely something that I think um, has been a challenge for a lot of sites. We're fortunate in that, you know, we have three coordinators and sort of a senior coordinator organizing all of our platform visits. And it's given us a lot of flexibility to, to schedule patients and really um, to be a fairly high enroller in the study. Um, the, um, I think the other kind of aspect that, that makes this a challenge is is the fact that you have sort of two screening visits for every patient who's going to be in the study. You have the master protocol screening visit, but also the, the regimen uh, screening visit. And, and that just adds a little bit to the complexity of the trial. Um, um, but, but it's really been a welcome challenge here. We've really enjoyed doing this study um, and have embraced um, all of these challenges as a way to really grow and, and, and learn better how to do really complicated studies. Um, I don't know if I have a whole lot more to say kind of about our site. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly, I don't know if Mary and Sabrina, we, do we have time for questions? Is it going to be at the end or is it going to be right now? Yeah, we can provide a quick update. I know the community is always looking okay. forward to the enrollment updates and then we can uh, take questions with you and, and really the feeling is, is mutual. Um, I mean, it's so great to work uh, with you as a site, uh, enrolling patients and, and, and obviously taking care of patients. And, uh, but also, as you said, I'm glad that you also mentioned uh, the clinic research organization component, which is so important for our trial. Uh, many of the people that are in the picture uh, literally fly all over the country to train uh, all our sites and ensure that all the procedures are done um, uniformly at all of the 50 plus sites that are part of the trial. So this is a key component of all trials uh, where we really need to monitor the quality of the data uh, really carefully. Uh, and because these are sort of what, what we call late stage trials that could actually lead to registration of a new drug. So uh, adherence to these processes, um, you know, would not be possible without the work uh, of the uh, Barrows team. So thank you for all of that. And so to, to quickly move forward uh, to um, uh, the, the updates, as you know, at this time uh, at the Barrow, as well as, um, uh, you know, at all the other sites where uh, we are enrolling uh, for four drugs, we're testing four drugs called regimen A, B, C, or D. The full names are on the slide. Uh, the trial uh, is a multi-step trial where we first enroll participants uh, and, and then we have a placebo-controlled period that lasts six months. Uh, and then we offer an open label extension that lasts many months uh, for people to receive active drug. So the way this works is that people, as, as Dr. Lada um, alluded to, uh, they have to first come in for a first ass assessment, informed consent, uh, and then if they're eligible, they can be assigned to a regimen, again, any of the four available regimens. And then after that, uh, participants will be uh, randomized to either active or placebo. Um, and um, and, and the randomization ratio is in favor of active, three to one. So for every four people that enter the trial, 
three out of four receive active drug even during uh, the placebo control portion of the trial. This first process uh, lasts up to six weeks, but we try to keep it shorter. But again, we have a buffer um, to, to ensure that all procedures can be um, done in this first phase. And then if somebody, after somebody is randomized within the regimen, then they will complete the placebo control portion of the trial that again lasts six months. And after that, they move on to open label extension. So if we can move to, uh, again, the next steps, uh, we can share the number of participants. Thank you so much for all your participation. It's really amazing to see uh, the progress. Uh, actually, it's really um, amazing to see. We have, um, at this point, over 600 people with ALS who have signed informed consent, the first step. Over 500 uh, have been assigned to a regimen, 458 have been randomized within a regimen, any of the four. And we already have uh, 139 people that have completed the placebo control portion of the trial and are currently on open label extension. You can see the breakdown uh, by regimen in terms of um, the randomization uh, within each regimen. Uh, the target sample size for each regimen is 160 approximately. So that means that again, we're getting there. Uh, we, uh, we only have a few more participants for regimens A, B, and C. Uh, obviously regimen D, uh, because that was started later, six months later, still has a lot of room. And we are uh, working on, um, uh, on launching regimen E later this year. So again, the idea is to continue to have spots available for people with ALS, just in new regimens, as we learn whether uh, the first few regimens work or not, we'll also test additional drugs so that there's never a gap. Next slide. And, and here I want to introduce some of the most important people in this organization, uh, Catherine Small and Alison Bullat. They are your point of contact. They are on the webinar. You can see them uh, here today. That's their contact information. And I see that um, the, the, the information on how to contact them is also being circulated so they can help you um, connect with the nearest site. Next slide. And I think the last slide is just a reminder that uh, we will continue to be here with you on a weekly basis. And we will continue to have guest speakers because we really want people to get to know our sites and the people that uh, they can work with um, depending on their location. So that's the list of the guest speakers that we have so far. Uh, we are working on scheduling more. Uh, and then again, the biostatistics webinar series that we previously announced uh, will be um, yeah, in, around September uh, or, or October. So that, uh, that's, that's been planned. Uh, but in the meantime, we really want you to get to know all of our sites. So with that, I will uh, start um, reviewing the questions and, and post the questions to uh, our speakers. Um, so the, the first question is, when would you have the results of the study? Uh, and, and so the question is wh whether it's going to be in the next few months um, or not. Maybe Dr. Sukovic, if you want to take that. Sure, thank you for that question. We'll have, uh, we're anticipating have the results for the first three regimens, regimens A, B, and C, um, next spring of 2022. I wish it was next month, but we wait, we uh, look at the data after the last person enrolled in the study completes their six months of the double blind period. So we're anticipating that enrollment might be um, uh, over for the first three regimens in early September, could be sooner. You know, we hope it obviously it's sooner, it depends on the enrollment. Um, and then um, you know, six months later would be the last visit, a little time to clean up the last data and then we have the results. And then we think that D will be shortly after that, uh, maybe two, two months after that. Great. So, so another question is about um, uh, if we can send the email information for uh, the patient navigation team. I believe it's in the chat. So if you look at the chat, uh, you can find the information that should have been sent to everyone um, with the email and, and phone number. Let me know if not. Um, there's a question about uh, respiratory onset. Um, so uh, re on, on rare occasions, people with ALS have uh, their first symptoms in the respiratory uh, system. And so the question is, is anyone studying respiratory onset ALS? I don't know if Dr. Lada want to comment first. If you yeah, sure. So, you know, this is, a, I think, a really difficult group of ALS patients to study. And, and there's a couple of reasons. Um, obviously, we recognize that this happens and, and um, I think a big part of the problem is that because the ALS is so limited to an area that frequently doesn't go to send it to a neurologist, I think this is a group that gets a, uh, that sort of has a longer delay in their diagnosis. Um, and as a result, 
they're much more likely, I think, in studies to sort of fail the typical inclusion criteria that we use. Um, so the force vital capacity by the time they get to us is, is usually lower than your average ALS patient. Um, probably their, their duration of symptoms is longer. Um, so um, I'm not aware of anyone specifically studying these patients, although there's, there are people who are very interested in the respiratory aspects of the disease. Um, but but I, I think I've illustrated some of the challenges in, in including some of these patients and, and why it's so difficult. Thank you. So, Vadusukovic, there's a comment about enrollment rates. It appears that in, the comment is it appears that enrollment has slowed down, um, and the question is whether this is COVID related. So, the question is also asks whether um, you know uh, what specifically has caused uh, the current enrollment rates, and also when new sites will be added. So, multiple questions here about oh, good questions. Yeah. You know, the, the enrollment rate does fluctuate a little bit week to week. I think in the in the big picture, it it uh, it's been pretty stable for the last couple months. It was certainly faster at the, at the beginning. I think there's a couple of factors for that. Uh, one is definitely COVID and not just, you know, what the effects for people coming in for visits and um, staffing, but really actually global supply chain problems. There's uh, there's still ongoing supply chain problems for blood drying um, tubes and kits and urine collections and that, you know, we, um, you know, obviously, the our central lab is working on that, but that that is one impact. But we're, um, you know, I, I think we're going to finish uh, um, hopefully early September. I'm hoping a little sooner for the first three, and I also hope that these these supply chain issues are going to be resolved by the end of the year. At least that's the projection that we've been told. Great. And Dr. Lada, I have a question. I know um, you're obviously, you see many people in the clinic, uh, and there's a great question about whether there's a standard protocol to inform neurologists about clinical trials. Obviously, if they come to see you, Dr. Lada, they, they, you would be uh, able to share all the information. But I guess the question is also, you know, uh, is it the patient's responsibility to bring up the topic of clinical trials? That's the question in the chat. Or uh, how do we inform neurologists? Or how do we, neurologists inform uh, patients about clinical trials? Yeah, that's, a, I think, a great question. And unfortunately, there isn't really a standard approach to this. I think there's a few variables that, that, have, um, that have bearing here. Number one is the type of ALS center. So a large multidisciplinary ALS clinic. Um, I, in, in that situation, I think most neurologists who work there, that's just part of what they do is talk about clinical research. It's an important part of, of the visit, um, just as important as talking about uh, cramps or breathing function or swallowing function. Um, unfortunately, what we what we know is that there's a significant number of patients in our country who can't get to those specialized centers um, and may, in fact, just be taken care of by a general neurologist in the community who doesn't have a large clinic, doesn't have a lot of patients. And those are, I think those are the times where those neurologists may not know about a lot of the clinical trials and they may not know how to access that. So, um, it's going to be pretty individual whether those neurologists actually on their own educate themselves. Um, I, I think, you know, as, as patients, um, it, you're your own best advocate. Um, and we know that ALS patients are great advocates for themselves. And so no neurologist, I think, will ever be upset if you ask about clinical trials and ask about how to be part of them. Clinicaltrials.gov is a great way for patients and neurologists to kind of look up what trials are where, and you can actually look it up by site or by state um, and find a site that's close to you if you don't have a neurologist who, who's participating in trials. Great, thank you. Um, so th there's, there's a question, Dr. Sukovic, perhaps you can take this, um, whether any uh, drug studied in the platform trial is anticipated to have specifically an influence on speech? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, the um, the only uh, drug that we've seen so far, uh, and this was a small study, was this drug, Nudexta. Nudexta is a marketed drug available for people with a different symptom called pseudobulbar affect. But in that um, in that study, um, the participants were telling their uh, physicians that their speech and swallowing was better. So Dr. Richard Smith from San Diego um, led a study with Niels to look at that and see whether that was true. And, and, and um, it was, this was a study supported by the ALS Finding a Cure Foundation, and it was absolutely true. So in that um, small study of 60 people, um, uh, we did see improvement in speech and swallowing. Great. 
I also wanted to ask if you have any information about the Biogen's uh, to person EAP, um, anything that you may want to share? I think we're all learning. I mean, we're, our site is putting in this uh, the protocol for uh, some of our patients who have SOD1 ALS to try to get that expanded access for them. Um, but uh, we're still uh, personally in the process of uh, filing the IRB, uh, the ethics review and the FDA. Um, so um, I, I know other centers are doing that. It just opened. So uh, we're all trying to do it as fast as possible. Right. So essentially the process is for each side to submit to their IRB, right? And, and then yes. have permission for their individual patients. That's right. And that was a decision by the, the company to, for each site to do it on, on their own. Thank you. Great. So I, um, we have had questions uh, about um, sort of when will participants be told whether they were on active drug or placebo during the, um, the placebo control portion of the trial. C can someone comment on that? I, I can comment on it. Um, so our, our goal is to let people know as soon as we can. And that um, is typically done after the um, double bond part period of the study is finished, the database has been locked and analyzed. Um, you, you, um, the FDA and other uh, regulatory groups do require that you not share that information until you're done doing your analysis and there's no more um, things you need to do with that, that. You don't have to unlock the database. So that's typically you know, shortly after the, the study is over. There are some companies who have different policies who might wait for the paper to be published or other things. But our plan for the Healy platform trials is to do it as soon as, as possible, meaning as soon as we have, we're finished analysis of whether the drugs work or not. Yeah, there's actually another question about communication of results. Um, so the, the comment that was posted is, there are so many things posted on social media that it, it becomes hard to tell what is accurate. So what is the best source to know what the, when the results of a regimen are known and what they are? I, well, I, I'm biased, but I think our, our uh, the Healy Center will be the best source of it because we're going to be doing the analysis. And our plan would be, of course, uh, to share it broadly um, through um, you know social media, through all the foundations. Um, we want to publish all the papers. Um, we'll, we'll be presenting them here, um, and uh, and through Neil's. Um, so that I think we'll, we'll probably, for this trial, for the Healy ALS platform trial, we, we would be the source, I think, of the, of the truth in that sense. For other trials, I do think, um, you know, the foundations often uh, put out notices whenever there's a trial result or the company that's running the trial. Great. I would just add, if, if you're a participant in the Healy trial, you know, your site neurologist, it's our responsibility to, to keep up to date on this. And, and most of the time, we're pretty happy to talk about what things you might hear on social media and, and give you sort of the pros and cons about whether or not um, it's reliable information. Great point. And actually speaking about that, uh, what would be the best way to contact your site? Uh, so the, the Barrow Neurological Institute site and you know, for people who are in Arizona or in neighboring states, how do they make contact and, and get enrolled at your site? Um, yeah, so, um, and I can, I can share it in the chat. Um, let me see if it's for, all panelists and attendees. Um, so our site, um, we, we do have patients from kind of all over who come to our site, um, certainly from other states. So you don't have to be a patient in our state. I know it's come up earlier about um, travel and, and that's something that if, if, if a patient wants to be seen at our site for the platform trial, we do have a frank discussion about kind of the rigors of, of what goes into a trial and how much you have to be here. Um, um, I will put, Jesse um, Duncan, who's our lead coordinator, um, she's the person probably to contact, um, and I'll, her email address is probably the easiest way to do it. I'll put it in the chat now. Great, wonderful, wonderful. I think we, these are all the questions for today, uh, but I think this was really great, and especially I'm, I'm grateful to Dr. Lada for being here and, and mm -hmm. sharing the information about the site. Any any final words? I also want to thank Dr. Lada for coming and also point out that Dr. Lada is going to be the lead investigator for Regiment E uh, for the CELOS trial that will start um, uh, this fall. And uh, he's, he's led many, many other ALS trials and we're excited to work with him on that role as well. Looking forward to it myself. Wonderful. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.